Hello, everyone, and welcome to Navigating Academic Integrity in the Age of Breakthrough Technologies. This is a Times Higher Education webinar in partnership with Turnitin. My name is Alastair Lawrence. I'm the Head of Brand of Content at THE, and I'll be chairing today's discussion. I'm joined today by a panel of experts from academia and industry, who include Patty West-Smith, who is Senior Director of Customer Engagement at Turnitin, Tricia Bertram Gallant, who is Director of the Academic Integrity Office at the University of California, San Diego, Leslie Lane, who is Coordinator of College Writing at the University of Lynchburg, Mary Davis, who is a Professor of Education and Student Experience at Oxford Brooks Business School, and Vyacheslav Dmitriev, who is Associate Dean for Faculty Relations at the Rennes School of Business. There will be an opportunity to put questions to the panel during the final five or ten minutes of the hour that we have scheduled today. So please feel free to write any questions in the box in Zoom, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we can before the end. There will also be a full recording of this webinar published on the THE website, alongside a summary article, should you wish to revisit the discussion or share it with your colleagues. An email to the record of the recording and the article will be emailed to everyone in the audience post event. The rise of breakthrough technologies such as generative AI are revolutionizing how we learn, work, write and create. This has had a quick and seismic impact on preserving academic integrity. AI is a tool and using this tool the right way is crucial, not only for making the most of its capabilities, but also integrating it into the academic ecosystem. Once, this is one solution that's already evolving, although as part of that process, it is presenting technological, pedagogical and ethical challenges for many institutions. So today we're going to talk to the panel about striking a balance between harnessing the power of AI and upholding academic standards. I'd like to begin by talking about ensuring the responsible use of AI powered tools when safeguarding academic standards and integrity. Patty, as a, a provider for the sector, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about how Turnitin's offering is changing and how it's having to adapt very quickly in response to this. Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, one thing I do want to add is that uh, before I came to Turnitin, I actually was an educator myself, uh, so I, I like to try to keep a balance between those two sides. Um, but at its heart, I think one of the things that we have to really focus on is, uh, is something that educators have to do anyway, which is setting really clear expectations. The communication element of understanding what is and is not acceptable in a particular context, um, and by context, I mean institution, course, class, assignment, right? Uh, setting those expectations at every level is absolutely the most important thing any of us can do right now. Um, because there is such a wide degree of understanding of what A, these tools can do, and B, how they can be utilized effectively and what is or is not um, ethical, um, that I think we can't start with any assumptions. We cannot assume that people are on the same page, and in particular, we can't assume that students are on the same page as educators. Um, I like to say that if you leave a gap there, you can always assume that the student is going to fill it with something different than what you wanted them to. Um, so it's really important to be explicit and communicate expectations. Um, and like I said, at every level, so that it's really clear to students where those lines are. Um, at the same time that we're equipping students with the skills to, to make these judgment calls. Um, so we have to be teaching them about the tools and about how they can and cannot be used, about when they are and are not effective, what they're good at today, which will be different tomorrow. Um, we know that I think something new came out yesterday, uh, right? So it's really important to keep on the cutting edge of that, um, which is the second piece that we're recommending regularly to institutions and educators, um, and that is having a dedicated space to keeping current. Um, because this is evolving so quickly, um, both the generative AI tools and tools like Turnitin's AI detector are evolving very quickly. So it's really important that you have currency with your understanding. Um, and as part of that understanding, I think it's really important to have um, educators who are using these tools themselves so they understand better uh, what they can and cannot do. It's one thing to read that. It's another thing to, to live it. Um, and then the way that you can communicate it to students also changes because you do understand it. We've conducted some surveys over the last 
year and a half since ChatGPT sort of came rushing onto the scene. Um, and what we know is that there's a wide gap between students' use of these tools and educators' use of these tools. That gap is closing to a certain degree, but it still exists. So it's really important for educators and institutional leaders to sort of arm themselves with the most current knowledge. Um, so I would say that those are the most important pieces. Okay. Great. Thanks, Patty. You raised a number of interesting points. One is the first, the key to engage with students as stakeholders, as as well as staff as stakeholders. And that gap that you talk about is interesting. And, and also the fact that it is, it's changing at such a pace, it's, it's very, very difficult to stay on top of that. Well, one thing I wanted to ask the panel more generally is, have you managed to move away from the perception that AI is a threat rather than a tool and, and just acknowledge that you, you do need to use it as a tool now? Um, uh, Slava, perhaps if we come to you first, yeah. that's okay. Well, actually, I would like to rather build on what uh, Patty said. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to hear uh, that this comes from a person from uh, from Turnitin, because this is our exactly our approach at Trend School of Business. And uh, last summer, we wrote uh, an update, we updated our academic integrity policy. And the very first thing we, we, we did is to define what is responsible use. I think that's the key question maybe we should start with. It's like, what is it, what do we mean by responsible use of, of AI or generative AI in particular? Well, besides the obvious aspect, which is, let's say, not generating discriminatory content, not using it for some... Uh, uh, illegal uh, purposes and so on. That part is obvious, but um, uh, what's more relevant and more complex, uh, more relevant to education is that it doesn't under undermine the goals of education, right? So, and then uh, and then we also define the responsibilities of, of every party. So first there is a school responsibility, which is to educate, what Patty also emphasized, both uh, learners and, uh, and the instructors. Uh, but then there is a lot of responsibility on the professors also because what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, therefore what's responsible or what's not responsible, really depends on the, on the course, on specific activity, on uh, a specific assignment and so on. And eventually, well, if we, if we really look at the essence, it depends on the, what we want students to, to learn, so on the, what we call intended learning outcomes. So at the school level, we cannot define uh, appropriate and appropriate use. So we put this responsibility on professors. And then there is, of course, the students who have part of their own responsibilities to be, well, to follow the rules, but also to be transparent, to be informed. It's also their responsibility to, to stay uh, informed about the, the rules, both school level and, and, and course level. So um, I, I, yeah. That's okay. No, I'd rather build on that, to be honest. I mean, I, just to follow up, do you notice any trends emerging already along lines of who the the early adopters are and who the um perhaps the keenest adopters are does it does it split by subject or school or profile of lecturer or, or do you notice any patterns emerging in that regard i think like with any other uh no well, generally people who are more comfortable with technologies are early adopters and then ai is not uh, is not an exception so the same people who were using uh, gamification, who were the first ones to to develop uh, their own, I don't know, plugins and model and so on. So to, uh, basically the geeks, but I don't think we can uh, cluster them in specific uh, domains. Uh, they're pretty much in every department. Okay, thank you. Um, Leslie and Trisha, you're both nodding, which is dangerous when we're all on Zoom, because it means I'll, I'll come to you next, inevitably. Um, Leslie, can you perhaps, we start with you, if you can perhaps um, tell us a little bit about um, how much of what Patty and Slava has said has, has mimicked your own experience or what's been different maybe? Um, yeah, so um, it, it, uh, my experience definitely agrees. So I, I get the feeling from faculty that, that I speak to uh, that um, it's, it's a little overwhelming because this a lot of the policy has been passed back to faculty and they're very ill-equipped to, to make the policy because yeah, a, a, a university wide policy is is going to be vague and not really that useful and you need course specific and class and assignment specific policies. Uh, and so the administration just says okay it's up to the faculty and the faculty are like what we don't know anything about this. <laughs> so um, definitely some uh, training and education uh, needed for faculty who are, are feeling uh, kind of scared and threatened and overwhelmed still. Um, and 
dealing with academic integrity, they're not sure what to do. Do I, you know, if it if the AI detection says this is AI written, is it is it a academic integrity violation? Do I do I pass it on as an honor code issue, or do you know how do I deal with it? And um, I try to help faculty figuring that out because I don't think that's going to be the, the way to go. There's going to have to be a different response for AI detection than say for plagiarism detection. Um, so, but I mean, we are at the very beginning and just discovering where we're going, you know, which direction we're going and uh, mm. we're pretty far from where we're going to end up, but <laughs> we're getting okay. there. Uh, that being said, you you mentioned uh, training and education to staff in order to you know, give them some assurances and give them some support. Is there, have there been any particular methods you've employed that have, have got good engagement from the staff and that you think have proved effective so far? Not at all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I've, I've offered sessions they're they're not well attended when i run into people they want to talk about it want to ask questions about it but uh i think getting the word out is going to take some organization some investment from universities um because this is this is a big deal and a lot needs to be done okay thank you for your honesty and candor um uh, trisha if you come to you next please and then um, patty after that um trisha i know you said in the past you, you spoke about the importance of in engaging students as stakeholders and i, mm -hmm. I wonder if that's a, a different process perhaps to the one that leslie's describing um yes and no i mean on the on the faculty um we can offer all the workshops we want but if they're not given the time and the the payment to to redesign their courses which essentially has to happen redesign their courses redesign their assessments then then we're not doing them any favors so if we all remember uh maybe the audience knows this but i think it's i i repeat this all the time because i think it's really important for us to remember and be uh, transparent about this is that faculty are not trained how to teach in their in their terminal degree programs at most universities or colleges they're not given teacher training like we do for k through 12 uh, teachers so they've never been taught how to design courses they've never been taught how to design assessments they've never been taught about when one pedagogy is better over another and i and i say never i'm speaking writ large some faculty have of course in sense but and for a lot of institutions like research one institutions in the United States, teaching is is somewhat rewarded, but it's not what's um, sexy, right? Like it doesn't make in the new U.S. News and World Report, or it doesn't make in maybe even in the in the Times Higher Ed uh, top university rankings either. So so we cannot expect, especially our contingent faculty or whether you call them adjunct faculty, to do this in their spare time anymore. It, we're the pandemic was bad enough and then and then this came along. And so I think we really have to, from an institutional perspective, take teaching seriously, which means, hey, I'm going to give you course release to redesign that course. And I'm going to give you most universities only have instructional designers for online uh, courses. We need instructional designers for in-person courses, too. Uh, we have to stop pretending that we know what we're doing in in-person courses because uh, we we often don't. Um, for students, it's kind of the same thing. When are they supposed to learn um, these things? Uh, you know, uh, you'll get the same, Slavo has mentioned, like the keen, you know, uh, nerds that pick up the technology first amongst the faculty. Same with the students, right? The people with the time, maybe they don't have uh, three jobs on the side. Maybe they're not raising a family. Uh, they have time maybe to delve into this on their own. But if we're not incorporating it into the classrooms, then a lot of students won't have time to learn. And so this I I I'll I feel a little bit like a hostage in a way from these external companies who have thrust this on us, and then we're supposed to build the plane while we're flying it, and that's extremely frustrating for for everybody. I think, and and I think we have to acknowledge that, and give people some breathing room where we can. Students and faculty alike to to learn this, but to learn again, as Slava was talking about the the responsible use. And so that includes helping students, anytime we allow students to use AI in their work, we should be asking them metacognition questions to help them reflect on what did I use? Did it work? Did it help or hinder my learning? Would I use it again? Would I use it differently? 
Um, and, and, and I don't know how many people are doing that. And, and so those are the things I would say is that we need to give people space and time and rewards, frankly, for, for learning this new, yet another new thing that they have to, to incorporate. Okay, great. Thank you, Tricia. And Patty, we'll come to you next and then and then Mary after that. Just a quick note for those of you who are asking questions in the Q&A, thank you very much. We're going, we're going to wait until about the final five or 10 minutes before we put them directly to the panel, though. So, uh, Patty, please go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to sort of chime in on, on, on what Tricia and Leslie were saying, because I do think that one of the things we have to recognize is that we're sort of in the midst of a major disruption. Um, and, and that takes processing time for everyone who's impacted like that, right? I think it's also important for us to bear in mind that this disruption is not just in education. Generative AI is disrupting society in many ways. Um, and there are a lot of ramifications for that. Um, and obviously, we're talking about what that looks like in the context of the learning process, um, which is incredibly important, but it is bigger than that. Um, and we do have to recognize that. So I, I think it's really important to call out that people are in search of answers and in search search of support. Um, it's one of the reasons why outside of any product development that Turnitin did, my team of educators, veteran educators, we actually developed resources for educators, how to have conversations with students about these issues, um, wh whether it is a, a misuse issue or a how do I understand how to use these tools and leverage them effectively and ethically. Um, and those are the resources that are getting absolutely the most traffic. If we, It's not the product that people are asking us questions about. If they're asking about how do I handle this? How does it fit in my workflow? What do I say to my students? What do I not say to my students? How do I prepare myself? And when we look at our data, that's where all the activity is from educators. So I think while we've shifted from sort of the initial, what I've sometimes called chicken little moment uh, when things were released and everyone was panicking and, you know, headlines were out there, that the essay was dying and academia was dead. And I don't, I can't even remember some of the alarmist headlines that were out there, but they were very extreme. Um, we've moved past that phase, but now we're in the phase where educators are really looking to people who have spent the time and lived richly and deeply in this space and learned things um, to understand how they can navigate this space. And that is not going to be perfect. And I think that's one of the things that we have to recognize with empathy is that there will be bumps in that process because, as I said, society and education are fundamentally shifting right now. Um, so I, I think we have to give ourselves and the educators that we work with some grace in this moment. But I would say, if that's the case, we also have to lend some grace to students. Um, and so that's why I was delighted. I think, Leslie, you said, or it might have been you, Tricia, who said, we, you can't just automatically hit that uh, integrity violation button, right, when you see something from AI. You have to give some consideration to understanding that there may be gaps in understanding and, and there may be cases where there isn't a shared understanding of what is okay and not okay, where there is a lack of education as opposed to a lack of integrity that is that is at work. Um, so I think all of those things are really incumbent upon all of us who, who have a voice and a platform. Um, so I, I just think it's really important for us to call that out right now in, in support of educators and in support of students. Patty, just uh, Mary, I'll come to you in a moment. Sorry, Patty, just a, a related point to that. Th this uh, echoes some of the previous discussions that we've had about academic integrity in general. When you talk about diverse student cohorts, perhaps international students who are studying a diff in a different country or in a different language for the first time, and um, it, it's that needs to anticipate what some of the trends might be. I suppose. I mean, you, you see, it's a, it's kind of similar but different now from a, with AI use in that regard. I think from a value perspective, it is not different, right? Like I think at the heart, educators are people who are concerned with learning, right? Um, and and so I, I don't think the right response to any concern about academic integrity is to automatically go to the punitive. Um, and maybe that's the teacher in me that thinks that those are always a learning opportunity in one sense or another. Um, now, that's not to say that you might not get to a place where something is such an extreme case that it does require a, a you know sort of formalized process but i think the first thing we should always be doing when there's a concern about integrity whether that comes from a tool like turn it ins 
in the context of similarity or in the context of AI or just a gut feeling that something is off is to have a conversation with the student. That is the first thing. Now, I recognize that that is sometimes challenging. The scale at which um, educators are working with students is incredibly challenging. Um, and, and in many cases, it can feel easier uh, to, to go that route of a formalized process and kind of pass that off to someone who you think maybe is an expert in that space, like an academic integrity officer. Um, but at its heart, I think that we, I think this is what I meant by saying we have to give some grace, right? We are in, in the sense of sort of traditional plagiarism, plagiarism, um, or AI generative, generative AI concerns, we have to always be mindful of where the student is. And it shows up with students who are, you know, uh, they're not writing in their first language, whether that's English or another language, whether they have other exceptionalities. Um, so, so there are a variety of factors, which is one of the reasons why we always say at Turnitin that uh, something like the AI detector is a piece of a larger puzzle. You have to know your students. You have to be thinking about what their work looks like. You have to think about what the changes are. You have to think about where they are in the process. And again, you may still arrive at a punitive place, but certainly it shouldn't be the first stop. Right. Thank you very much. Um, Mary, thank you for waiting. Please, if your thoughts on this. Thank you. Uh, there's so much to comment on, but I'm going to concentrate on three areas. The first one is this is a moment of celebration for academic integrity. I'm looking at the participant numbers for this particular session approaching 700. I've worked in academic integrity for nearly 20 years, and we've never generated this level of interest since um, everything took off with um, chat GPT. Uh, you know, we get gigantic audiences. Thank you so much to everyone who's on this call, uh, because we really want to reach out to you and and work with you. Um, so that's the first thing I wanted to say. The second is I strongly believe that the guidance we need to give to students is about their practices. It's not about the tools, although we need to know about the tools and it's really good to um, uh, do some analysis of the tools. I don't think anyone's mentioned that yet, um, but things like, you know, what's a good tool um, for research purposes that uh, could be employed for ethical use. I think that's that is a good way to go. But overall, it's more important to look at practices. So uh, responsible use is also about ethical decision making. And I want to explain about um, what I've done at my institution, Oxford Brooks. So based on student declarations, so um, we get students to declare their use of uh, artificial intelligence. And then I analyzed those uh, declarations and I made a course based on what students were doing uh, to then guide students with ethical decision-making. So this sort of practice is absolutely fine. This is to be encouraged. Uh, this practice is really problematic because and then in the middle, not a grey area, but actually an amber area in the middle of my traffic lights um, to say this is what you've got to check. You need to hang about here and and check further. So um, the result of that has been that we do have some kind of tangible guidance in place that students can go to at any point when they're preparing an assignment and think, OK, if I do this, uh, you know, what 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 would the um, sort of analysis of that practice be? Um, and it's also guidance, uh, this course that they should do before assessment. So it's giving them um, something to go on. The other thing I wanted to say, looking ahead to uh, assessment changes or looking currently at assessment changes, um, I, I honestly think we've got to focus on our detection, if that's what it is, of knowledge, not detection of AI. AI is, is in everything already in so many places that we don't even recognize it's there. So although, yes, we need to be aware of misuse of AI where it's uh, sort of interfering with student authorship. At the same time, we've got to come back to our assessment 
look whether it's fit for purpose and uh, really look at focusing on um, knowledge detection. Is the student demonstrating their knowledge of uh, the learning outcomes? Are they meeting those? Um, because that's the most important thing. Sometimes I think we're getting really clouded with this issue looking at AI detection. We should be focused on knowledge detection. That's what educators are for. Thanks. Right, Mary, thanks. I've got a couple of quick follow-up questions, but they might not be quick. We'll see if I'm, how complicated they are. But the um, one of the things that's come through quite a lot, and I'm going to have to conflate a few of the questions because, um, as Mary noticed, there are several hundred of you joining us. So thank you again, but there's too many questions to ask in the time that we have. Um, one, A lot of the questions that we're getting are very much focused on you know, what training should there be for teachers? Like you're, you're providing this framework for students. Like how do you ensure that level of buy-in? You know, I mean, obviously, Leslie spoke earlier about the, the challenges of getting buy-in in that first instance. You know, Trish went into a bit more detail about the, the incentives that are needed in order to get buy-in from faculty. But do you envision a similar framework or a scalable solution for faculty to the one that you've been speaking about for students? Okay. Um, I think the first point to acknowledge is that students are always going to be ahead of us in terms of technology. Um, you know, younger generations will always be more engaged in the latest technology than older ones. That doesn't mean there can't be uh, buy in among um, uh, older educators, but, uh, you know, it, it takes more encouragement, perhaps. Um, so uh, in, in terms of my institution, so all uh, staff, I, I should say educators, all those involved in educating can also do that course. But we are noticing the gap that others have mentioned. Um, probably all of us are, are aware of a gap between uh, student practices and staff practices or student um, knowledge and, and staff knowledge. Um, faculty, uh, if that's the right word. Um, so uh, we do need to do a lot more, I think a lot more in terms of um, supporting uh, faculty. So um, we haven't yet developed a, a parallel course, but what we're doing is running frequent staff development uh, events, uh, drop-ins, um, uh, sort of, um, peer mentoring, um, lots of in different initiatives at different levels to work with um, faculty. And one uh, particular one I've, I've been involved in is um, a, uh, a, a case study um, project uh, where each ca case study is looking at uh, different innovations with pedagogical innovations with AI um, to share. So actually that's a um, not just institutional um, uh, project, it's, it's, um, it's quite global actually, but we're going to use those in our teaching and learning conference and it's open access. So I think, I mean, one of the big things from events like this and and others engaging people is is that community building and sharing because we we really benefit from the conversations and the sharing of resources okay great thank you very much and yeah on uh, sharing resources you'll be able to see seamlessly i'm segueing into this there's a, a document that's been shared that's um, authored by trisha so trisha thank you very much for sharing that and um, we'll try and link to it in the the post event article as well but for those of you who can see hopefully there's a, there's a google docs link in the webinar chat if you want to click on that and bookmark it to have a look later um leslie you'd like to add something uh, yeah, so in, in my experience with um, using AI in the classroom and, uh, you know, jumping on the bandwagon as, as soon as ChatGPT was out, I, I redesigned my um, freshman writing course. Um, so there's three things that are really important when it comes to um, what what faculty, faculty need to know and understand to, to be able to move forward just, you know, from the beginning. Um, the first is assignment design. Uh, there's going to need to be some redesigning of assignments and rubrics, and this is one of the best ways to not have to worry about AI use and AI detection is 
if you design your rubric to value the things that AI is uh, does poorly, then you can just grade what you get. And if it if it's AI written, it fails. And I that has been hugely helpful to me um, working on my assignment design. And there are other ways to set up your assignments to to help with that. The other thing is. If, if we're using writing in the classroom, um, focusing on the writing process is huge. Uh, faculty need to understand that they need to see things at stages along the way. I mean, that, that was already good advice, but <laughs> definitely now that AI is on the scene, it's even better advice um, to, to focus on process parts and, and see the writing in stages from the students. Um, and then the third thing, uh, that faculty need some training on is the response, which I mentioned earlier, is how to respond to a AI detection. Um, I, I don't think that getting rid of AI detection is gonna solve any problems either. Um, I like to know when my students don't trust their own voice so that I can have the conversation with them about why they don't trust their own voice. Why don't they feel like their words are good enough? And those are the same kinds of con conversations I had with plagiarism detection, you know, why are you using somebody else's words instead of your words? Um, but that that follow up conversation does take time and faculty have very little time. So they kind of don't want to hear that. So ways ways of managing that and making that happen as, as part of the classroom process is uh, going to be really helpful. Um, so yeah, those those are the things that I think are like the first and foremost uh, to address with faculty. And, and Leslie, just, I mean, I know, again, you've spoken about the challenges of implementing these kind of policies, but do you set yourself timelines to sort of benchmarking to see if you can see the levels of adoption and improvement there? Um, yeah, so I, I redesigned my, my freshman writing course and built that in so that I could see and then built the conversation in. So started using grading conferences with students, which takes a huge amount of time, but um, then I get to have a conversation with everybody, <laughs> but yeah, building that into the, into the semester process, uh, really helps. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, Slava, we'll come to you next, please. Yeah. And then Trisha after Thank that. You. So first I'd like to quickly address the question from the audience. Somebody was asking, how do you train uh, faculty? Just a little, uh, sharing of best practice, so to speak. Uh, Microsoft uh, have very nice, um, learning pathways, learning paths that they share with the academic partners. So there is a lot of very nice content uh, available asynchronously. So we have this and we shared it, but of course there are also workshops, peer-to-peer -peer sharing and so on. But Microsoft provides very nice um, uh, asynchronous content. And then I'd also, also like to build a little bit on what Mary and, uh, and, and, and Leslie said uh, about detecting knowledge uh, rather than uh, uh, mis academic misconduct and adapting the assessment practices to, to the use of uh, generative AI. Um, I personally, maybe I'm a minority, but I personally think that adapting assessments to the use of generative AI is rather simple. Uh, I feel like we, we had a workshop on this topic with the faculty um, about a year ago. Uh, and then we came up with ideas and then what you read in the in the media and professional journals, it's pretty much what we figured out a year ago. So more authentic evaluation, more staged evaluation, et cetera, integration of where it's possible of uh, use of generative AI in the assessed activity, assessed activity itself. So there is not, not much more that you can uh, invent. Uh, but what is challenging, I think it's more important, is uh, adapting uh, the uh, the competences that we need to deliver to our students, basically adapting the the structure of the program and the competency model. Uh, because sometimes we we realize that look, okay, we cannot control that. We cannot uh, be sure that students use or didn't use. And on, on top of that, uh, actually g using generative AI on uh, in this competency. It's, uh, it's actually, it makes a lot of sense. So why would we even control it? So now what we're doing, for example, uh, we're reconsidering the assessment rubric and also the, the list of intended uh, learning outcomes for our gradating projects for master thesis, basically. And we're reconsidering. So why, what do we even assess? Before we would assess the quality of writing, right? But we, we don't need to assess that anymore because who needs, uh, well, first, it's not even a matter of trust. 
but it's just such a, it's an obsolete uh, competency we can say right so we will go in competency by competency and we're analyzing it in terms of how compatible it is with the use of generative ai does the use of generative ai interferes with this competency it uh, undermines the objective of education or it complements it so uh, i think that's um, that's the way to go it's to to reconsider the structure of the program starting from the program objectives and then see how these program objectives uh, translate to specific learning outcomes for on the course level and reconsidering all that uh, how it uh, how it works together with generative ai does it uh, complement it generative ai complements it or it interferes with it slava do you think there's a bridge to be built with with industry here and i'm asking given your your background as a business school professional where the type of things you're talking about okay well we test for this we don't test for that because some things are you know kind of just a given at this point in terms of how people are changing their approach to the world of work because yeah. it's not just in academia that ai is automating processes that didn't used to be automated it's also jobs and more specifically graduate jobs yeah. too i mean um pre-AI I would interview law professors and they would talk about okay well these are the skills that you need to teach someone for instant recall that a, a barrister or solicitor or a litigator would need to have and here's the knowledge that you don't really need to test in a controlled academic environment because when they're in when they're in office they're not going to they're going to use you know Google or what or you know Lexus or whatever other resources to to find these things so I mean do you think there is a case for strengthening yeah. collaboration with industry for student pathways here so that you can improve your feedback loops and make sure that you are not that you're on the same page as employers and that you're aligned and so they understand what your students are being told going into the workplace and you also have a, a glimpse of what they're being told when once they're being asked to upskill and reskill when they start their job yeah, I think Alistair, your the answer to your question is in your question. Okay. There's obviously, room for improvement by integrating uh, industry in in the curriculum development. Absolutely, because as as educators, we're very well aware what uh, skills, what competencies are now uh, obsolete or we shouldn't test them anymore. But uh, we we don't know what's really happening in specific. Uh, uh industries uh, the level of specific uh, professions and so on so when we update our uh programs curricular definitely that should be one of the discussion topics with the how do you call them the expert uh, panels that we usually involve in the curriculum revision cycles so yeah it's it's, uh, it's pretty pretty obvious yeah Another big job. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, Trisha, if we come to you next, please. And then Patty after that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Where to start? So respectfully agree and disagree with Slava, of course. Um, that's what we're here for, right? So I don't know that learning how to write is a defunct skill yet. We don't actually know what the process, we, we don't know what the process of replacing our writing with chatbot writing will do to the brain. We don't know what it'll do to critical thinking. We don't know what it'll do to all sorts of um, those human durable skills that um, employers want, right? And so the, the struggle we've always had in universities is uh, and I want to bring this back to academic integrity since it's the focus of the of the webinar. The problem we've always had in, in universities in particular is, are we preparing students for a, a, a life where they can learn and develop new skills and switch jobs as needed? Or are we preparing them for specific, you know, very specific careers or very specific jobs? And so, yes, Slava, yeah, we have to rethink our learning outcomes, um, and we should always be doing that. We should have done that when the internet was invented, and a lot of us didn't do it uh, then. <laughs> so, And then we have to figure out what skills, what basic skills do we need to still teach students that we still need to assess to make sure they have with secure assessments. Um, Mary's and my colleague, uh, Phil Dawson in, the, in Australia, is, it has written some great books on on. Um, assessments in the digital world and and really talking about assessment security start uh, starts where academic integrity ends and there's there are some times where we are going to have to assess competencies in a secure environment without the help of AI to make sure students have those foundational skills and then perhaps we allow them to cognitively offload 
those things to AI once they understand them. Right now, students are using AI pretty blindly, pretty uncritically. And they're not, as Leslie says, like understanding where their voice should start and where it should end and where the AI voice should start and end. And we really need to equip them with those human durable skills and at like communication skills, interpersonal skills, like empathy, um, uh, collaboration, you know, you know them all, right? Because that's what's going to set us apart from AI. We're not going to, uh, there'll be, the saying was going around that the people that will have the jobs are the people who can do their jobs with AI. I, maybe, but also I think the people are, that are going to have jobs are going to have those durable human skills because eventually we're going to be over this hype and we're going to just want to be around and work with people who are people and don't just sound like bots. So I don't think we should uh, throw at the total baby with the bathwater, uh, to use a horrible saying probably, but looking at how can Gen AI, to Leslie's point about all these awesome like conferences that she's doing and having conversations with students that take up a lot of time, how can we use Gen AI for the faculty to free up their time from administrative type duties, maybe even a little bit of grading, at least immediate feedback grading, you know, kind of basic uh, feedback, to free them up to do more of this human to human interaction with their students. That will help academic integrity because we know students cheat when they lack intrinsic motivation to learn. We know they cheat when they have no sense of belonging. We know they cheat when everybody, they think everybody else is cheating. And so if we free faculty up to do, to do these conferences, these oral exams, these whatever directly with students, all of those causes of cheating are diminished. And so that's what I think is way more exciting for me rather than kind of saying, you know, one of the questions in the Q&A was, do we still have to require students to write in English? I think that's a fantastic question, right? Um, I don't know, <laughs> but it's a good question for us to be asking. Maybe in their English writing classes, they need to be able to communicate in English, but maybe not their chemistry class. I don't know. Um, so anyways, I just wanted to kind of sum that up by saying, let's think about what durable skills students need to have what can they what do they need to learn first before we allow them to cognitively offload to ai and then from a competency based education perspective what competencies what secure assessments can we design around those competencies to make sure we're not just graduating cyborgs that we're that we're actually graduating human beings that that critically use tools reasonably responsibly and appropriately Great. Thank you very much, Tricia. We, we, we do have 20 minutes left, but I'm aware we're probably going to burn through that quite quickly. So, um, Patty, if we come to you next, please, and then Mary after that. And I'll, I'll try, um, for those of you asking questions, please keep them coming. I'll try and incorporate as many as I can between now and the end. So, uh, Patty, please. Yeah, I'll try to be quick, but I think one of the threads you're hearing from all of us is that there, there is this idea that, that we have to rethink assessment, um, right? Because I, you, I think Mary said earlier, fit for purpose, right? Which is such an important question to ask ourselves, what is it we're actually trying to assess, uh, right? And I think this, Trisha, this goes to a lot of what you were saying is, is it right to be asking students to write in a particular context? There are many instances where a writing assessment is a wonderful way to assess what you're after, but it isn't the only way and it isn't right for every scenario. So I do think that there's a lot of sort of stepping back and asking ourselves, what exactly is it I'm assessing here and what's the right way to do that? It could be that the future looks like assessing how students use generative AI tools um, in writing or elsewhere. That it, That is a absolutely going to be a critical skill in the world. Um, for them to, so that's a thing to consider. But then there are instances where it is not right because fundamentally what we know from brain research is that writing is part of how people make meaning from the world. It's one of the things that helps them to process language, to make connections between new ideas and existing ideas. Um, it literally lights up the brain in many ways. So I don't think we wanna say that writing is not important as part of the learning process or part of the assessment process, but we do have to be mindful of when it is appropriate for writing to be a part of that. And, and I think to the question of redesigning assignments and redesigning assessments, one of the things we have to consider is, 
How do we make our assignments and our scoring criteria less vulnerable to AI misuse? And notice I said misuse, not AI use, because there is a time and there is a, a wonderful way to potentially use AI AI in, in these cases, but we have to clarify that. We have to communicate that to students, and then we have to teach them how to do that. Um, and so I think there is a lot of, of work that has to be done. Slava, I think you might be in the minority in thinking that's an easy process. You're probably just brilliant. Um, but I think for a lot of people, it is not an easy process. Um, it is absolutely a time-consuming process. And Trisha has made this point several times that time has to be created for people to do this work. And they will need support, especially... I think it was Trisha as well who made the point that many instructors at the higher education level don't have training in teaching. Uh, they're, they're experts in their content, which is absolutely critical, but that doesn't mean necessarily mean that they're experts in teaching and, and pedagogy. Um, and so I think there is a lot of room that has to be made for that in order for us to realign to where we are uh, uh, today. Right. Thank you, Patty. Um, Mary, we'll come to you next, please. Yes, yeah, so a fairly brief point. I, I really liked what uh, Tricia said about human durable skills. And I think one of the things with artificial intelligence is, is kind of turning it on its head and valuing the human more and, and also valuing the, the student tutor relationship much more than perhaps... Uh, I have felt certainly that with things like anonymous marking, anonymous feedback, you're kind of moving further and further away from, from the student. And um, I think it, it, it can also be an opportunity for us to reprioritize that relationship between educator and a student for sort of more meaningful um, contact. And also that assessment, um, so... Things like oral assessment, whether it, it, it be a vive or, or something perhaps more creative, interactive. Um, I'm a big fan of Monica Ward's work on interactive oral assessment, um, looking at really quite meaningful uh, role playing simulation type uh team activities that that can be performance based i think it's a time to at least reconsider this this sort of um assessment and and also to uh reevaluate the educator student uh relationship thank you very much there's a, a couple of questions i'm reading all of the questions from the audience and trying to find a way to summarize the nearly 50 questions we've been asked into two or three that I can condense down towards the end. Um, a, a, one point that a couple of people made, I think it may have been uh, perhaps Leslie or Trish who, who made the point about teaching what AI is bad at. Um, that was a phrase that sort of stuck with a few people. Um, I was people just asking for a bit more clarity on that and and how you can demonstrate to your, I guess, your, your teachers and your students where the, where the limitations lie and and why it's it's useful to to teach to and pass that limit and also how you do it. Well, Leslie's probably got some good, good examples from her, her moral class, her own class. And uh, so I'll just say one thing and then, and then let Leslie chime in. So I think just giving them a prompt, uh, you could, you could have them use the tools, but again, some, some people don't want to use a tool. Some people don't want to sign up for these tools. They don't want to give their private information away to these tools. And so you always have to have that, that, um, ability to, to accommodate that. So maybe just give them some output, give them the, the rubric, especially if, as Leslie says, you've advanced the rubric up the, up the taxonomy a little bit and then have them assess it, have them critique it. You're developing their critical thinking skills. You're making them see how bad it is. Most of the time is the students, if they're guided in playing with the tools and, and seeing the output and taught how to critique it and evaluate it, they discover pretty early for themselves that the output's pretty bad. But to Leslie's point, if you haven't adjusted your rubric, um, it's not bad enough to fail. And so, and C's get degrees. So some students might see that and go, I'm okay with that. I'll, I'll hand that in as my own because I'm okay with that C. So you you still can't do that without without Leslie's point of adjusting your rubrics. Okay, thanks. Um, Leslie, if you could give us a, perhaps a little bit more detail about um, the uh, the when you spoke about this earlier. 
So yeah, absolutely. So uh, when I when I first redesigned my freshman writing course, I decided we were going to learn together, and and I've kind of kept that approach all the way through the three semesters I've done with the freshmen, um, and I I have put in lots of different workshops, getting to them to use Chat GPT because that's the free one, um, in a number of different ways, and even you know after doing it the first time, I know that some of the things that they're going to do on it, it's going to do terrible, and some things it's going to do really well, and the students are quick to discover um, what it what it does well and what it does poorly, and the really important thing is they they learn that what you get from it is not gold. <laughs> you can't just copy and paste. You've got to anything you get from it, you've got to work with. Um, I get them to do reflections and talk about you know what they like about it, how they use it, what they would use it for in the future, things like that. Um, so they they do. I can tell that they really have a good understanding. Um, but yeah, so I mean, if you need a numbered list, then you know, Chat GPT is <laughs> it's your thing. Uh, it loves the numbered list or a, a, a bullet point list. Um, but if you ask it to write an essay or a paragraph, sometimes you get a bullet point list. You know, it's just not really good at at writing um, essays. And I was responding to somebody in the chat. Uh, it it has uh, and and several different ones that I've tried have they have an idea these AI programs have an idea of what an essay looks like and Chat GPT is particularly bad about giving you an entire essay full of background information and uh, the the real analysis and the the real argumentation is just like in one paragraph and so. I value the argumentation and, and the analysis part very heavily in my rubric. Um, the background information is very low on the point scale. Um, so, you know, knowing that it's me, knowing that it's bad at that allows me to, to value, you know, what I need to value. Um, but the, the process of discovery with the students is great. I mean, we, I just tried one thing just recently with them getting it to write a conclusion, big picture, um, uh, trying, you know, trying to talk about why this topic was important to discuss uh, for the ends of their essays. And it, it couldn't do that. And we had so much fun just going around the room and saying, you know, oh, it, it gives me a perfectly good thesis and support points and no kind of um, larger notion of why this this is an important topic to talk about. <laughs> it could just uh, so discovering the failures is, you know, can be a lot of fun too. Um, but students are quick to pick up on it and uh, and it can be useful for faculty as well. I see. So it's very much about the um, teaching students to recognize critical thought and critical arguments in others as a way of um, developing those skills themselves. Yeah. And the critical thinking is there, like when, when we use it to get, you know, some possible support points, once they've decided on a topic to write about, you ask it for support points, it'll give you like 10 or 12. And you kind of have to pick out three or four that might be good. And some of them are not support points at all. Like they'll say revise and edit. That's not a support point, <laughs> so, you know. And so the students have to critically think and look through this list and pick out the ones that they could actually write a paragraph about um, and, and that would actually prove what they're trying to prove. So the critical thinking can still be there, absolutely. That's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, Patty, who comes to you next, please? Yeah, I, I just really want to support everything that Trisha and Leslie have said, because I, I think it's right on point. I, and it's funny because, you know, in the in the first days after ChatGTP sort of made headlines, uh, I, somebody came to me and they were like, Patty, we need to write a blog that is best practices for uh, teaching with generative AI. And I was like, you do realize they're like, we don't know yet. <laughs> we, we don't know what those best practices are. But, you know, 18 months later, we do have some ideas. And it turns out that much of what we already knew to be best practices around teaching and learning, about teaching writing, about assessing with writing, about assessing assessment design, much of the best practices are, are still applicable. That It hasn't changed the fact that we need to focus on higher order thinking skills. It hasn't changed the fact that we need to make sure that our assessments feel relevant and engaging for students in order for them to take them seriously. It hasn't changed the fact that getting students to think about their thinking and to evaluate tools and understand which tools best serve them. Um, all of those things are best practices that have been around for many, many years, and, and they're not different. We just have to put them in the context of AI tools and understand what that means. Um, 
but but it is going to take time to make those adjustments. Uh, but, but it turns out that the best practices are still the best practices. Thank you. We've got about five minutes left. There's one other talking point that we haven't spoken about yet that I'd like to raise to the panel, um, not because I think it'll be easy to answer, but just to get a uh, to take advantage of the fact that that we have an international panel with us here today. And, and that's to talk about the role of regulatory frameworks in overseeing the use of AI in education. We, we've already addressed this partly, which by talking about the, the huge variation and the, and the different forms that policy implementation takes across individual institutions i was just wondering if you had any particular thoughts about you know whether you think government uh, regulatory or regulatory framework rather rather than government bodies it's um whether it's feasible whether they are even you know further behind in that gap that that patty spoke about right at the top of the hour um Trish, you're, you're nodding, looking slightly resigned about this, but I don't know if I'm reading that wrong. Um, if you could just uh, let us know what you think, please. We'll try and get around everyone. Well, yes, I'm both pro and, and con external regulatory. I think we need to, as institutions, do a better job of regulating ourselves so that we don't get outside people who don't know anything about education regulating us. On the other hand, I'm very envious of the QAA system in, in Britain that Mary could talk about and in Australia, New Zealand and Ireland, where they have they have stepped in to regulate uh, cheating in the sense of making contract cheating illegal. Um, and that is really helpful because uh, we can't do it alone. But I would I if there is going to be government regulation on education, I would hope that we would be. 90% of the partners or the drivers of that rather than the people they consult after the fact that they've already drafted something. Okay, thank you. I mean, you, you mentioned Britain. So um, uh, Mary, perhaps we come to you next and get your thoughts on this. Yes, thanks. So um, yeah, I am a member of the QAA UK advisory board on um, uh, academic integrity. So uh, yeah, the QAA is uh, coming out with a lot of um, uh, sector guidance, really useful for anyone in the UK higher education on this uh, call. Please do have a look at QAA documents. Um, I would say for everyone, though, um, the UNESCO uh, framework for um, artificial intelligence is, is a really useful resource. I think um, linking uh, institutional guidance uh, to that is quite helpful. Um, in and then in the EU, there's the um, the AI Act, um, which I think is is also a useful uh, reference point. Um, there's also UK government uh, guidance, which sort of focused very much on safety. Um, I mean, I th I think it's important for educators and institutions to be aware of this sort of. Um, framework of, of guidance. Um, we also have the JISC, um, what's it called? I think it's the Centre for Artificial Intelligence, and, and that's a really fantastic resource as well. Great, thank you. And um, Slava, what, what's your experience been in this area? Well, to be entirely honest, I'm not um, aware of any regulatory frameworks that put restrictions on our uh, teaching and learning processes. I am aware of UNESCO and the EU AI guide, but those are just uh, guides, basically. Uh, I do know that uh, accreditation uh, bodies now require that you address uh, uh, AI in your uh, policies, academic integrity policies, and so on. That's what we're currently doing when we're re applying for reaccreditation of our master program. So we need to explain how we address, how we integrated uh, AI in our academic integrity policy. Um, and uh, we'll see, uh, we'll develop our <clears throat> rules and I hope they will, um, they'll be happy with them. That's right. my limited experience so far. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Patty, I guess you have a you, you're fairly neutral on it must be fairly neutral on this given that you're being an international operator. Is it is it something where you like to you you hold out much hope for these things? I mean, do you think it's gonna take the kind of the um sort of almost like the collage approach or cumulative approach from the, the different resources that that Mary and, and others have spoken about? Uh 
so from a pure regulatory perspective, in terms of like governmental regulatory perspective, um, I think it is going to vary greatly around the globe, just like I think Tricia alluded to contract cheating. If, if you look at every country in the world, there are there are and are not laws. So I think we're going to we're going to see a great deal of variety in terms of the approaches that places take. I suspect that privacy will be the first place that we see a uh, regulatory push. Um, but uh, it's hard to say. And again, it will be very uh, sort of, I think of it as a quilt. Uh, the world will be a quilt in terms of what that shows up and the degree to which it is uh, regulatory. Um, but I think it's important to remember that there's there's a level down from that. Uh, I think Trisha alluded to the idea that institutions themselves can do a better job of creating sort of frameworks uh, to, to work in. Um, and, and that may help us to stave off some of this. So I think there's still a lot to learn. Um, and, and also it's important to remember that the technology itself Self is developing at a very rapid pace. Um, so even if regulations come out tomorrow, they will probably be outdated next week. Um, that might be a little bit extreme, but it's certainly there's a very, very fast development process that is in place. And I think that's mindful. One of the things that I always say, whether you're talking about regulatory uh, from the government level all the way down to the classroom level, is is to think about um, to try to push ourselves out of a binary mindset. I don't I don't think that this is a this is a space where we should be thinking of this is all wrong or this is all right um, because there is going to be a lot of gray and context will matter. I think that's always difficult to regulate effectively um, when there is a lot of gray area. So I think it's going to be a very interesting time um, and, and there will absolutely be a wide spectrum of responses. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, that takes us up to time. So sadly, we'll have to end things there. We could probably go on longer, but I think we probably all lose our voices. Um, so uh, thank you again to Patty, to Leslie, to Tricia, Slava, Mary, and also our colleague Jennifer from Turnitin, who's been helping out in the background, answering some of your questions. As I mentioned at the top of the hour, there will be a recording for this. It will be available on demand on the THE website. We'll also circulate that to everyone who registered. So thank you all for coming in such huge numbers and asking all your questions and taking part. Thank you again to our panel, and we hope to see you again at future THE events. Thank you and goodbye.